one of the things that people say about me is that I, uh, I like to network, and that's true. And I don't look at it as something that's a deliberate thing. It's not something I'm trying to be the, the Twitter climber of the year or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I really believe in empowering people and connecting all the wonderful people that I've met in the course of my work. And that's a lot about what you're going to hear about today. I'm here to tell you that it's time to connect your classrooms if you're not already uh, globally. Um, there are ways to do it that are easy and, and, and ways to jump in like, like Homa was saying. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about how I arrived at that conclusion and, and, and my journey on that a little bit. So connect now. Um, one of the most amazing professional events of my life happened this last November. I, along with Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0 and a consultant to the video conferencing platform Illuminate, we did a global education conference online. Um, how many of you, uh, uh, how many of you uh, listened to a session? All right. I thought there were a few of you out there. How many people presented? Okay. And how many of you were our partners in this that were the partners? We had a couple partners here, too. So there are people in this room that you can talk to about this conference afterwards, and I hope that you'll join in as well. So uh, it was the most amazing, exhilarating, exhausting event of my entire life. And, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. And it's all online, and you guys can access it and that sort of thing afterwards. So this is Steve. Uh, how many of you know Steve? <laughs> Steve is one of the most amazing people I know, very professionally generous and kind, and uh, a person, another person who probably doesn't sleep a lot. And if you d see any of his sessions on thefutureofeducation.com, um, he always starts out with this map where everybody takes a tool. And it, it, for, first of all, Illuminate has, um, has a, a chat area for participants, and it has uh, a whiteboard area, and then um, other tools that are involved. And you usually hear an audio or a video feed. You can look at a video feed and, and participate with other, per with other uh, listeners in the chat area. And so Steve, at the beginning of every session, always puts up this map that you'll see in the right-hand corner where you're supposed to mark where you are so we get a sense of where the listeners are coming from. And it's, it's just, every time he does it, it's just kind of Steve's thing. And so this is uh, actually a screenshot from our closing session at this conference. And we were, at this point, um, we'd been, Steve and I had probably, he'd been online, I know, a couple days for 23 hours. Um, I'd been online probably, I don't know, 12 to 15 hours a day at least. And we were like pretty exhausted and pretty giddy. And in this picture, I don't look too happy. And somebody thought I was still in my pajamas, but I wasn't. I just hadn't bothered putting makeup on. And the guy on the right, though, he was still in his pajamas in Australia. So, uh, so we had this like amazing closing session where uh, after Milton Chen, who was our closing keynote, finished, we all went into another chat room and, and kind of debriefed about the event. And I've never experienced this feeling of, of feeling bonded to people around the world in a virtual setting. And when people say that technology is dehumanizing things and is, not, uh, is making people more isolated, I beg to differ because I saw that day people really excited um, new friendships made, new partnerships made, new projects formed because of this. And so I want to tell you a little bit more about the story of how that actually happened. Um, the day after the conference ended, my eight-year-old son, Henry, uh, came home from school. And I'm like, Henry, the conference is over. Isn't that exciting? I'm, I'm really thrilled. It literally had just ended. And he said, he pointed to this chair in the corner of our living room, and he said, now you can leave that chair, Mommy. And um, this is the blue chair where I was ensconced for the, that week. It was pretty, pretty intense. So anyway, this, these are some uh, screenshots here of, of different things that happened during the conference. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we did and how this came about. Um, the whole story, backstory is a little fuzzy to me and Steve because this happened over several months. But I believe the idea came to Steve at Educon in Philadelphia in 2010. And he came to me and said, what can we do with the social network that you, I, I run a social network called the Global Education Collaborative. Uh, what can we do with that, that Ning and Illuminate that will, you know, be significant, will significantly impact education? And I said, let's do an online conference similar to the K-12 online conference where people have asynchronous and synchronous opportunities to connect. And so uh, it kind of uh, went by the, you know, it kind of went by the wayside for a while and then at COSIN, um, another conference, um, Steve had the opportunity to participate in an international symposium and realized we really, really need to do this. And so we started planning it in March. Uh, it was literally him and me and uh, Julie Lindsay, 
uh, from the Flat Classroom Project, ran in a teacher advisory board of about 100 educators who volunteered their time. We had about 100 partners of uh, IEARN, EPALS, Asia Society, groups like that. And they uh, helped us get the word out and get presenters to come. And we literally built this in, our website was a Weebly site uh, that Steve paid like $5.95 a month for. Our, we used Google Docs, we used Wikispaces, and we used Google Calendar quite a bit. And what the coolest thing about this was, um, Google Docs, um, or not Google Docs, Google Calendar has this, you can buy this separate piece called You Can Book Me, and it lets you book your own sessions. So we didn't have to do, wrestle with all the details of people booking their own sessions, our presenters doing that. And we, um, and, uh, and so when you booked yourself, it went into a Google Calendar that went on the website. You could click on your time zone and see all the sessions that were in your time zone. So we kind of got, across, we kind of got away from some of the problems that are working across time zones with that. So uh, it was really, uh, so anyway, this is some of the feedback. Um, that was some of the feedback that we got from the conference. It was really positive, really affirmed my beliefs about what, how things came about. Um, and we're going to do it again this year, and we hope that you'll participate. So some of the lessons I've learned, uh, learned along the way are um, on the road to this pinnacle event were that time is of the essence with this sort of stuff. We can't just wait for this to happen. We can't wait to decide to go global. It has to happen now. The other thing is professional generosity really drives this kind of thing. And we need to start being more professionally generous and showing what we're, as educators, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I still firmly believe I'm an educator, show what we're worth, what, what we can do, because obviously the message isn't getting out because we're quite beleaguered right now. And the third thing is, too, that we have to kind of extend our boundaries and, and, and reach out uh, across the world in lots of different ways. So let me tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, these are Henry, this is Henry and Julia, my two kids, and this is why I do everything I do. I think that I look at schools on my consulting work and um, talk to other educators in hopes that I'll get that magic formula for what their school should be doing. I want to know, that's my, they're my litmus test. Would I put my kids in the school? Would I have want my kids doing this project? I, I think about them and how they would benefit for something like this. I guess that's ultimately my selfish motivation. I also, during the course of preparing for this presentation, I realized I miss being in the classroom too. And so I'm kind of jealously looking at everybody and all the projects that they're doing and thinking about what would I do if I were still in the classroom. I, I think it's a really marvelous opportunity right now for teachers to do, this, to do global projects, and, and that's what drives me. So we don't have, um, my kids are second grade and sixth grade. They don't have the time for the school to get their act together and start going global. They need to be doing it now. And this is not something that we can wait for. The other piece I will add to this, too, is I do some work with schools um, in Chicago, and I've noticed that in schools that are um, you know, facing um, AYP challenges and that sort of thing, that 21st century skills, for lack of a better term, are not being discussed. They're, it's just not on their radar because they're worried about their reading and their math scores. And I, it, it really frightens me that we're not looking at the comprehensive whole package of, of what these kids need in order to be successful for college, for life, for whatever. And so I think it's not just the place of elite schools or schools that are making AYP to be talking about these, these kinds of skills. And so I, I just think it's really important. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with a colleague and this person was doing amazing things with educational technology. And I said, you should blog about this. You should share what you're doing with your colleagues. I think this is just great stuff. And she said, no, they can learn the way that I did. They can RTFM, if you know what that means. And I get 25 emails a day from people asking me about this. And I hit the delete, delete, delete button. And that was a pivotal moment in my career or thought process that I was never going to be like that. And I hope to God, if you're here, I think you're probably not along those lines. But during the Global Ed Conference, this guy, if I'm clicking right, this guy, Larry Anderson, who's a friend of mine from Mississippi, he was the epitome, along with hundreds of volunteers at this conference, of professional generosity. And what happened during the conference was uh, Larry just stopped in to see what was going on to check it out. He hadn't been involved with all the planning and that sort of thing. And he was so struck by what he saw going on that he went and he looked at the Illuminate training video that we had prepared, and he became a moderator and started moderating sessions right away in, in this, and we were short on moderators all the time. So he was in there quite a bit, um, probably just as much as Steve and I in some, in some days, uh, helping to moderate and cheer everybody on. And it, he was just an example of many people who were doing this. Um, 
it was amazing to see people, especially with Spanish translation, uh, with this conference, they were jumping in and, and going in, into these rooms. We had a, a, a conference uh, lounge where people could stop and get help or the moderators could uh, get their assignments and that sort of thing to help the speakers who in, the, in their individual Illuminate rooms. And uh, it was really hilarious to see how people bonded in there and how they just said, I'll go there, I'll go there when we needed them. So the power of people coming together and being professionally generous and, and thinking of others is really, I think, something that's very vital to this work and it's been um, important in my journey. The other, rec the other thing that I've learned is that we really need to push our boundaries. And, and this is a picture of me in Singapore uh, a couple years ago, and I'm eating barbecued stingray. And I am not normally a person that relishes new foods. I really have to be coaxed into doing this. And I've realized I need to try, I need to try these things or I miss out. And the same thing with global education. If we don't try something with our kids, they're going to miss out on rich and authentic experiences. And that's what we really want school to be about. That's what I remember my school experience being about. And I'm afraid that's not going to be happening at the rate things are going these days. So pushing our boundaries, even if you've never done it. I'm not necessarily the world's savviest traveler or speaker of language or expert on global education. But I believe in this connectedness will bring us together. And so pushing our boundaries and getting um, others to do so is really important. So in 2006, I had the opportunity to travel with um, this group I belong to called the Apple Distinguished Educators. We went to Europe and we wrote a global awareness curriculum. And that was probably the first time I really realized there is no excuse for not going global. We had the technology. Obviously, bandwidth is a problem in some places. But for us in the United States, at least, we can do something. We can e connect within the United States, at least. and. Um, we, it, it's, that was 2006, and here we are in 2011, and I'm not sure how much farther we are along in connecting our classrooms. So if we don't expect, we should be at least providing virtual experiences for our students, and we may not be able to take them to these places, but technology with Google Earth, with what, Skype, with whatever, we can bring our kids to these places quite easily. So um, as inspired by Steve Hargadon, uh, Classroom 2.0 site, which has now 50,000 members, which I just find mind-boggling, um, I started in 2007 a NING uh, called the Global Education Collaborative. And we have 4,700 members in there right now who are looking to do projects, who are looking to connect with you guys. And um, it is a little bit US and Australia and UK uh, heavy, so we're looking for other people to join. But this is a place where Everybody can kind of post their projects, look for partners, find resources. And it's not meant to be the one place for everything. It's meant to be an umbrella for bringing organizations together, individuals together from kindergarten to higher ed, and uh, to kind of see what, the, to kind of map the space in global education. Because there's really no one-stop shopping uh, entity out there to find out what's going on with global stuff. So uh, this is one place to go. And I also wanted to mention that iEARN, which has been probably the, 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 lead, the pivotal uh, global education group, um, they also started a, a project where they're mapping schools that are being globalized, too. So you may want to take a look at their website. And I believe it's, it's being officially announced soon. So um, there's some work going on around that. When I was preparing for this, uh, one of my Twitter friends, George, who's from New York. I don't think he's here. Is he here? Um, uh, said to me, can you distill why global connected classrooms are vital in 2010 more than ever before? And I think about, oh sorry, I just blasted you. Um, I think about uh, a book called High Noon by Richard, who many of you may have seen speak at ISTE last year. And he talks about 20 problems that are, need urgent addressing in the world. And these problems are not going to be solved by individuals, by individual countries, they're going to be solved by us working together across boundaries. And so if we do not teach our kids how to learn in a networked situation, how are they going to solve problems in the future in a networked situation? So we're prepping our kids for taking over what we should be doing now. And it's really important that we get this across to our leaders that this is what we need to do. If you need further convincing, obviously the events of, of, of recent weeks should, get, should tell you something. How many people know who the guy in this picture is? Who is this guy? Anybody know who this is? Arvin? This is a Googler who did what? The, uh, yeah. yeah, this is the guy who, a Googler in Cairo who 
said Facebook started the Egyptian um, change. And so we've seen it in, in Egypt and Tunisia and Bahrain. Um, lots of things are going on. And it, our kids are immersed in social media. And if they're immersed in social media, they're going to be immersed in these events as well. And if we don't teach them to analyze and, um, and be interested in these things that are going on in the world with real-time information at their fingertips, we're losing a great opportunity to help our kids. Um, this tweet here is from a friend of mine named Atif, and Atif is down there in the bottom. And he teaches at an international school in Cairo. And he said to me during all of this Egyptian stuff, he said, help us get the word out. And I'm like, well, I think we know about it here in the US. I think we do. I, 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 what do you want us to do? And I think the problem is, is that we haven't looked. We, we hear it, and we, don't, and we internalize it, but do we act on it? And I think that's the problem that we that needs to be addressed with kids. How do you and take this information and act? And so it was a very fascinating time for me um, in terms of this. The other story I have, too, was last week we had David Pogue, uh, the New York Times technology columnist, speak at the Illinois uh, Technology uh, Conference. And uh, in the middle of his keynote, much to my mortification, a woman said, <laughs> Facebook is destroying Islam. She yelled out in the middle of his keynote. And he wasn't talking anything about this stuff, let me tell you. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, that's not part of my program here. And he said, I don't have a slide for that. Um, but it was, I, I think this woman was kind of confusing some things. I don't know if she was a little unbalanced, or if there was a religious thing going on there, or what. But the, 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 what's been going on in the Middle East is not about religion. It's about power. And, and it was totally inappropriate. Anyway. Um, so that it just made me think that there's more of a need for global education and for really understanding these issues more than ever. This slide is a picture of um, trees in an arbor, a, a kind of an arboretum, uh, by the German Jewish Museum in Berlin when I, I was there in 2006. And to me, it represents kind of my awakening about global awareness and global education. And, um, and so I want to invite you to join me in this journey that I'm still on, trying to figure out how to connect globally, how to do rich, engaging projects with kids and that sort of thing. And I often think of the TED Prize that they give at the, at the official TED conference. And Dave Eggers has got it before, and Bono, and all these you know, really famous, fancy people. And if I had the opportunity to have a TED Prize, my wish would be for you guys to join me on this, to join the Global Education Collaborative and share your work and learn from others, and also to participate in our conference, which is going to happen again November 14th through 18th, I believe, this year during International Education Week. So please join me on that journey <coughs> and share what you're doing in your classrooms as well. Thank you.